past week. Did you get some new toys for Christmas? Yes. You want to take good care of those toys? I'm going to take really good care of this of this game that I got because it's brand new and I'm going to take really good care of it. And you know what? You know what today is? Today is January 1st. We have a brand new year that starts. That starts today. A brand new year. And you know what? We need to take really good care of our brand new year, don't we? How can we take good care of our brand new year? Any, any ideas? You can people can make we can make promises to God to do what? What can we promise God that we'll do this year? Any idea what we can promise God we'll do this year? Any idea? Landon, do you have an idea of what we can do? Promise promise we can make to God this year? How about you, Claire? We can be good. We can be good. Yes, we can. And we can be it promises to um, to pray and make promises to go to church and make promises maybe to, to obey our parents. So those are some promises that we can make. And we want to keep those promises that we make to God in this brand new year, right? Are we going to keep our promises that we make to God? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to head off to Children's Church nicely and quietly. my turn. <laughs> if not, you can certainly pull me down off the stage. I believe it is. Meet me, if you would, over in Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> I've learned two things about your pastor today. He both has very short legs, very short pulpit, and he has very big ears because it took me 10 minutes to get this plant down around my large ears. So, learned two things about him this morning. Thank you all for having me here. Um, I have preached here several times before, so I'm not going to give an introduction other than my name is Brian, and I want to have all of us focus in more on Jesus than we ever have before today. Amen? Can we do that this morning? Um, today, being the Sunday after Christmas, not necessarily being January first, and I see Pastor Joey who snuck in in the back, and he might be standing up. I'm not really sure if he is or not. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I've been waiting to say that for years. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really have saved that one for a very long time. Thank you so much. Um, today being the Sunday after Christmas is usually known as um, the youth pastor gets to preach Sunday, or the day that most pastors take off, or low attendance Sunday. There's a lot of you here this morning, so that's great. So I appreciate the opportunity to fill in this morning, and I hope that we all see Jesus in, in all that we do. Over the course of the last year or so, my wife and I have been, the thing that we always tell people not to be, and that's we've kind of been church hoppers. We've gone to a bunch of different churches all over Wilmington and all over town, and I heard one message, it just left me very, um, when we left, I was actually very angry, and my wife had to be like, calm down, dude, like, it's fine, like, we're leaving, you don't ever have to go back there again. Um, I heard a guy take a verse of scripture that's one of the most important verses of scripture. You'll find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It says, God took the one who knew no sin to be sin, so we might be the righteousness of God. That's about Jesus, and that's a sentence that wraps up the Bible and the gospel in a nutshell. And this gentleman said, let's not focus on that. Let's, I, don't, I don't want that, this is a direct quote, I don't want that to overshadow the crux of this whole passage, which would be, how persuasive we can be to the world. And friend, if you look at the scriptures that way, it is wrong. I hope this morning that you're not upset with me because I don't have a, a message where we can make um, New Year's resolutions or as, as we do in the spiritual world, we grab onto like a spiritual buzzword and then we hold on to it all year long and then we are disappointed when we fail. But you know why? A few years ago, if I would have had a word, it would have been beautiful. Look at me now. Didn't end up all that beautiful, right? I had a buzzword one year maybe that would have been wealthy and I ended up unemployed. 
Had another word one year, and that was successful. Ended up unemployed again. So all of those words that you might put your hope in that aren't the gospel, I have bad news for you. And I hope you didn't go and get yours already tattooed on your ankle this morning. <laughs> if it's not Jesus, it's going to let you down. My, my heart is bent in this way, and I'll draw it together for you so it'll make sense as we get into this passage this morning, is that I am greatly convicted that we, as Christian people in 2017, ought to band together for solid and sound Bible teaching. You should praise God for Pastor Joey, who is here, who endeavors to teach you about the glory of God every single moment that he's around you all. You don't, not uh, other people in other places don't have that great privilege. But I think we should all band together for the rightness of God and make very little of ourselves as we do that. So what I want to do this morning is I want to walk you through a passage, a parable that all of you that have grown up in church are pretty familiar with the story of the prodigal son, right? Most of you, even if you've never been at church until today, you can tell me a little bit about the story of the prodigal son. You can say, oh, that's where the, the kid runs off and the dad comes and gets him. Or you can say, I heard someone tell it in some other way and they modernized it and made it really cool. But I want us all to look at it with fresh eyes today, no matter how much depth you think you've already gotten there. Studying the Bible and worshiping God is, is not an academic exercise, nor is it a time where we just find life applications and all of it. It's, it's bigger than both of those things, and it contains both of those things. When we worship God, we're lifting high His glory, and we're meeting God in a way that we can't meet God otherwise. So I would, I would ask you to endeavor to do both. Look at this as in terms of an academic knowledge and how much you know, and as a point of of how it can straighten the path of your life in the name of Jesus and nothing else. So if you have any sort of resolution today, it would be to stand firmly against what I would call biblical liberalism. But when I say that, you might, you might imagine one thing, and I, and I want you to know that I mean partly that and partly something else, because if, if liberalism would be a path, it has a branch with two, it has a fork in the road, and both of them are the same liberalistic path. One of them leads to license, which is, I'm free to do whatever I want regardless of the consequences. The other one leads to legalism. Both of them are equally as wrong. I don't have to define legalism for Baptists, right? We're good on that. We know that. So what I want to do this morning is I want to look at the story that is the worst subtitles a human ever gave in the Bible. This should be called... The story of the prodigal God is, as Tim Keller and many would say before him, that would be the story of the generosity of the one that created us. So what I want to do this morning is very simple. I don't have a bunch of points in a poem. I want to read this passage to you and pray, and I want to walk back through it. And I want us all to experience the glory of reading the Bible in that way. However, before I read, again, I, this is the longest introduction I've made in a very long time, man. You're going to think, I'm never going to make it to the restaurant time, but I promise Sandy this army was getting out of here on time. And I'm not going to break a promise to Sandy. This chapter, Luke chapter 15, it has three separate parables in it that we often teach separately. A lot of times we'll teach them on different Sundays or, or what have you. I, I don't have time, nor do I have it prepared to do all three of them, but I want to read to you what Charles Spurgeon said about all three of them so we can be on the same page as we start to look at it. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. The third parable would likely be misunderstood without the first parable and the second parable. We have sometimes heard it said, here is the product received as soon as he comes home, with no mention being made of a Savior who seeks and saves him. Is it possible to teach all truths in one single parable? Does not the first one speak of the shepherd sheep seeking the lost sheep? Why need repeat? What he has already said before. It has also been said that the prodigal returned of his own free will, for there is no hint of the operation of the superior power upon his heart, that is, the Holy Spirit of God. However, that is clearly described in the second parable of these three, and need not be introduced again, as it were, to the same audience. If you put all three pictures in a line, they represent the entire compass of salvation, yet each one is distinct from one another, 
and by itself very instructive. So I want to pick up chapter 15 of Luke. I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Read along with me. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he had nothing. Verse 15 says, Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who went into his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carol pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, and yet I am here dying of hunger? I'll get up, go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with great compassion. He ran and threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22. But the father told his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said, your brother is here. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has come back safe and sound. And then the older brother became angry and didn't want to go inside. So his father came outside and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you. And I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Verse 31 says this, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But what we had to celebrate and rejoice in today because your brother, the brother of yours, was dead and is now alive. Because he is lost, he was lost, and he's now found. Would you pray with me? Father God, we love you. God, I ask that all of us look at this passage without some pompous attitude that we, that we know it all, without a rush, without a hurry. God, when we, look, when we all look at it with a heart that we want to be drawn closer to you. God, would you help us to gauge our spiritual temperature? As we look at this passage, God, in this time that we that we arbitrarily set aside so that we can have new goals and new resolutions, God, would you help us to resolve to be the best followers of Christ we could ever be, and nothing else? God, would you help us to make much of your Son Jesus and little of ourselves this morning? In that name, we pray. In the name of Jesus, Amen. <clears throat> Great commentary writer as he was writing on the story of the prodigal son here. He, he said this. He said, this story is primarily about the lavishness of God's grace. And it gives us a unique opportunity to take our own spiritual temperature by observing how we relate to God's extravagant love through the characters of the two brothers. Where we stand depends on how well we were able to step into the skin of either the first brother or the second brother. I want to add to that and say that if you can find yourself relating to either brother, your spiritual temperature is way off. I want to make the case to you this morning that, that both of the brothers are off and the hero of the story, as in the hero of every story, is God. So let's walk back through this and, and look at this as we go. It's a story that you're very familiar with. The, the younger son goes and he says at the beginning of the parable, I want 
my share of the estate. Now, what does that mean? You know what it means usually? It means usually that the parents have died. It usually means that someone has died and passed away and they're receiving their inheritance. So this younger son, I want you to understand the gravity of the insult here. This younger son wanted to live life like his father was dead. He wanted to go ahead and cash in on every piece of valuable asset that his father might have had. He wanted the good stuff, but he wanted to live as though his father didn't exist. Do you see the picture of the gospel that's painted in there? Do you see the picture of, of my sinful behavior and yours right there at the very beginning? I want what is mine. It was never the younger sons to begin with. And the father in this story, as, as you know, he gives it to him. He says, go ahead, take, take your share of the estate and see what happens. When we try to do anything apart from the Lord our God, we're going to fail. And we will find the same fate that the younger brother had on some level. If not on a physical level, you will absolutely find it on a spiritual level. So the younger son says he wants his inheritance. And as an aside, if, if you're here today and you are one of those people that our hearts, that my heart bends for, that I have been in that place and, I, and I've been in a different place before. If you're one of those folks where you have gone younger son and you are running from God, I want to tell you a little secret that maybe will end your run from God. Is that you can't hide from God. The more that you run from God, the closer he'll be right there. And as empty as that sounds, I promise you that it's true because this Bible that we herald and hold so high says that it's true. If you're here and you're praying for one of your children who's maybe gone, who's a younger son, again, don't give up hope because the God that we serve loves your children. Do not give up hope. Do not give up prayers. Don't leave today having a lack of hope, but have an abundance of hopeful joy. That the God that created me and created you has all of this right squarely in the palm of his hand. So the younger son goes off, he takes his inheritance, and what does he do? He does what all of us would do, probably. He squanders it. He becomes so poor that he has to go and take a job as in the parable, the, the dude's probably a Jewish person. I don't want to add to the parable. Think about this. A story being told to Jewish people. And it says that, so the kid ran out of money. And he had to go and feed the pigs so they could be slaughtered to be eaten later. That sounds like a terrible job for a young Jewish kid to have. Seems like maybe one of the worst jobs you could have as a young Jewish man. So if I were a Jew in that time and Jesus was speaking to me. By the way, Jesus has a twofold audience that he's speaking to. Both the ones that have declared freedom and the totally lost and the ones that have been legalistic and the Pharisees. So he has both of these folks in front of him and he says, this man went and spent his inheritance and he became so poor that he had to go and feed the pigs. And I would bring your attention to, again, the gravity of the situation of the younger son and that it said that he was so poor that he desired to eat the garbage and the secondary type of vegetation that was fed to the pigs. He was so hungry, he wanted that. And it's so sad, if you, if you see it, it says no one gave him any. So the kid is sitting there, wanting a little morsel, and the pigs won't share with him. The owners won't share with him, and he has nothing. I've been there before. Most of you that would say that you are born again in Christ, you've been there before. Usually you've been there just before the Holy Spirit of God removed your spiritual blindness and you see clearly this thing called the gospel. Because when you look around, no matter how much you have, apart from God the Father, you have nothing. And unfortunately, God knows that we as silly, stupid humans that like to worship ourselves and like to put ourselves on pedestals and like to put ourselves above everything else, including Him. 
we unfortunately sometimes have to see the bottom before we can look up and see the light. That's where the younger son got. The younger son, in all of this, the story goes on to say that, that he realized that he was so poor that the least of his father's servants would be treated better than this. And he said, I am going to go back to my father. But I, I want you to be crystal clear, if on nothing else, on this part of the passage, and where the younger son decides to go back. Verse 17, when he came to his senses. My, my daughter is turned one. Her name is Madeline. Her middle name is, is Alethea or Alethea, as we rednecks say in my family. And the word Alethea in Greek means a moment of enlightenment. It's a special word for revelation. It's a special word that they use in Kohen Greek, which is not here, but it is a similar word. Whenever this young man came to his senses, when he had a revelation of the greatness of his father, what did he do? He said, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to tell him I sinned against him. He said, I'm going to go back to my father and ask him, not that he put me back where I was, where I thought I should be, as the one who should be given everything, but if he could just make me the least of his servants, because being on his property, in his kingdom, in his property, is way better than being off of it. Again, do you see the thread of the gospel through this? Do you see why we shouldn't mock this passage and think that we can tell a, bear, a better parable than Jesus told? Because when we start to make our own parable out of a parable, you know what we make? Senseless garbage. We make something that makes no sense. And we miss the gravity and the importance of the gospel thread through it time and time and time again. So the younger son said, I would like to go home under these conditions. None. This is why he saw something and he did something that many of us would refuse to do. And he repented. The word repentance. He saw the error of his ways in light of what? The glory of his father. You want to know how sinful you really are? Don't measure yourself up to me. Because most of you are better people than me. Measure yourself up to the one and holy God who has no equal and no other. And you will see how short all of us come and how all of us need a Savior. The younger son had to experience catastrophe before he could look up and see the glory of his Father. Then he repented, and it says he came to his senses. And I don't want you to think there is some lack of spiritual implication where the younger son was like, I'm so broke, I just got to head back to the house. That's where the previous two parables would come in. And you know, I wish it would end there. I wish God would have ended that parable there. I wish the father would have told the son, hey, wrap it up right there. Because then I could just tell you, hey, look, all of us good church people, let's pray for those that we know and that we love dearly that have run away. And let's feel good about ourselves. Because, you know, we're here in God's house. We're good to go. At least you came this morning. And in true fashion, being the Savior that He is, He said, being present isn't good enough. Let's look at the older son very quickly. The older son, when he found out that his lost wayward brother had been found and came home and that his dad was excited about all of it. And just take note of as the younger son came home, we're going to get to this at the end, that the father said, we're going to treat him the best that he's ever been treated. We're going to give him the greatest robes. But so the, younger, the older son hears all of this and what happens? He's angry. He's angry. The older, the older brother, who, who should be happy that his little brother came home, right? He should be ecstatic that the one who was his little brother that he grew up with, his own flesh and blood, who was so hungry he wanted to eat the pig's food, had come home. He should have been excited. Maybe he came home and... Whatever little donkey little brother came in on was in his donkey's parking space. And, you know, we're just not going to have that. The older brother, it says that he was so upset about all of this that 
Don't miss it. He says he didn't want to go into his father's house. He was so upset by the love that his father showed for someone else. He said, I would rather not go in. And again, don't miss this. This is the glory and the love of God for those that are here today. Then maybe, maybe you faked it all the way to being a deacon. Maybe you faked it all the way to being a Sunday school teacher or a church leader in some way. And you miss the gospel the whole way through. God still loves you and wants you to be born anew in Jesus. When that older son said, I am going to sit outside. The father went outside to him. And the older son, he let the older son run his mouth a lot like I would run my mouth. And a lot like, honestly, I have run my mouth. Why does he get the thing I think I deserve? Why does that guy get to do the thing I want to do? Why does he get to do something I'm better than him at? God, why? Maybe you're, you're sitting there thinking, oh, I've never done that. Well, you're a liar. We've all done it. We all like to shake our fist at God and say, God, why does that person get the privilege and the prosperity that I don't have? It doesn't matter what level you're on. We've all been there on some level. Maybe some of you have gotten well beyond that, but I bet you can relate to it having been there. I certainly know that I can. And he replied to his father and he said, look, I've been slaving many years for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. I draw your attention to the fact he said he never disobeyed his father's orders. And there's just simply no way that that's true. Because the father had ordered just then for everyone to celebrate at the arrival of the younger brother. So in this, what he is doing, the irony in all of it, when he says, Father, I've never disobeyed your orders. That is disobeying his father. When we want to question God, when we want to say, God, I should have that. And they shouldn't. We are being disobedient. We are displaying a lack of faith. And I tell you, if you can't get excited when other people come into faith in Christ Jesus and you're a church person, you, you really need to take your spiritual temperature because you're dead. If you can't get excited when you see other leaders raise up, if you can't get excited when other people take and blossom in different roles in Christian ministry, you have something wrong. He said, I've never disobeyed your orders and you never gave me a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. Catch this in verse 30. He says, then this son of yours came. He's disowned the younger son. He's disowned his brother. And he says, this son of yours. I did this the other day. My daughter has started to finally walk around and she shouts at me. Ah! It's over and over and over again. If I close a drawer that she wants to open up because she thinks I've hidden like her, her teddy bear in there, she will look at me and just shout. Ah! And I say, Alyssa, come get your dog. <laughs> or if something smells funny. And I go, definitely not me. I say, Alyssa, come get your daughter. She needs to be changed. Right? But when she does something good, when we saw her first steps, that's my girl, right? <laughs> Many of you dads and grandparents can relate to that. And you moms probably are offended I said that because it's all too real and all too truthful in your lives. We like to take credit where we should have credit and we like to pass and give blame and responsibility to others, just like the older son. <laughs> A great theologian once wrote, wrote this and he explains it as I begin to round toward home better than I could ever explain. It says the older or elder brothers are lethal. Imagine what would have happened had the younger brother encountered his older brother when he first returned. His older brother would say something like, so you've come back, huh? Things didn't work out like you thought. Well, too bad. Listen, little brother, you're not welcome here. You broke your poor father's heart. You've disgraced us all. And you've only come back because your money has run out. If you still had some cash, you'd still probably be gone. At least have enough dignity and self-respect to come back to your father when you have a decent job and you can get yourself all cleaned up. I did youth ministry for a very long time and that's basically what we told older teenagers, older students. Once you wear the right clothes, you're going to be welcome in big, big church. 
Once you look the right way, you, you have the right behaviors, you're going to be accepted into the church. And I tell you, it all starts when you have that mighty revelation that the gospel is true, that the speaker of this parable, Jesus, died in your place for your sins. When you have that mighty revelation, that's when behaviors will change. We sometimes get it backward and we think much like this man describes the older brother that somehow, somewhere we have to earn our way back into good standing with God. When if we could do that, there would have been no need for Jesus to shed any blood. But we cannot do that. The older brother was saying, honestly, if we're honest with each other, what would sound fair on a physical level? I've worked really hard and I've been around you. Why can't I have more stuff than he has when he said that he would rather act like you were dead? Say, God, I've, I've done so much for you and I've sacrificed all this time and I've been to all of these committee meetings and God, I, I cooked homecoming lunch and God, I made my kids come to church and I beat them if they spoke in church and God, I, I, we looked great. You know, sometimes we mistake as those that have the privilege of growing up in Christianity in the Christian church. We mistake blind obedience with faithful obedience. There's a passage in the Old Testament um, when King Saul is told to go and to do something specific for God. He doesn't do it. It's a long story, long story short. He doesn't quite do what God tells him to do. And then a prophet comes and says, Thus saith the Lord, why didn't you do those things I told you to do? And Saul says, well, I thought it would be better to do it my way than your way. <coughs> and the prophet responds to him and says, thus saith the Lord, it is better to obey, obey than to blindly sacrifice. So sometimes we come to church and we blindly sacrifice, taking that shotgun approach to the Christian faith. And we say, I'm going to get it right somewhere, so I'm going to do everything. And somewhere, like I'm going to hit the bullseye some way, somehow, blindly. And I'm going to get it. Seems like God would call us to a more precise method of worship and serving Him and using our lives to His glory. The older brother wasn't being obedient out of the love for his father, but he was being obedient out of selfish ambition. And the thought that the more he was around physically the stuff of his father, that he would somehow be in the good graces of his father. But that is not true. another aside how did the older brother know what the younger brother had been up to whenever he was shouting at his father like a fool he said and my brother had been with prostitutes how would he know that unless he had been keeping tabs on his brother he knew what kind of situation his brother was in and this parable mentions no effort for the older brother to reach out you would think that he would be even more excited to have known the deplorable situation that he was in. St. Augustine put it this way about this parable. For it is not by our feet, nor by a change of our place or position, that we either turn to God or from God. In our darkest affections lies the distance from the face of God. The young son had been far from the father in a distant country because of his sins. But yet upon his revelation and repentance, he was closer, even on his journey back to his father, than the older son had ever been sitting in his house. Mark Twain once wrote that about one of the characters in the book. He was a good man in the worst sense of the word. And friend in, in Christ, I, I want you to know that I have met, I have met many a good person in the worst sense of the word in church. But we see through all of this, at the very end of this parable, God says he was lost and now he is found. This brother of yours was dead and is now alive. He was lost. And is found. And it ends without knowing how the older brother responds, but it doesn't matter. 
and it ends in a good way for us as church people to reflect how do we respond to something like this. The truth is that the younger brother was right in his lowest point. He sinned against such a great father that he wasn't worthy to be let back into the family. There was no reason to be let back into the family. But when the younger son came to his senses and repented, he saw the greatness of his father. And then his father graciously and lovingly restored him back into a better standing than he was before. He didn't earn it. You remember that part I mentioned just a few moments ago about the young son, I told you to hold on to it, being given the robe? Well, you know whose robe is the best in the house? It's dad's robe. It's dad's robe. The father said, go and get my robe and place it around his shoulders. So the younger son, at the very beginning of the passage, said, God, I, Dad, I want your inheritance. I want all that you have, and I want to act like you're dead. But you know, he really got his father's inheritance when he embraced that his father was alive. When he embraced that his father was the one that he needed to focus on and lean on and to see that his father was the one that set the path straight. <clears throat> and just like that, and just in the very same sense that the father in the parable puts the robe around his son, we, by virtue of the death of the one that told this parable, by the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we get the privilege of being clothed in the righteousness of God. If you are alive in Christ Jesus, when all things are said and done, you get judged not in light of yourself, but in light of Jesus. I don't have to, to face a fiery hell and damnation, which is what I deserve, because I get to be robed and clothed in the righteousness of the one that died in my place. Our Father in Heaven, God Almighty, has given us a great way back into right standing with Him. Because nothing we can do can possibly right sinning against the holy and perfect God. God sent Jesus to die in our place. One of the most, one of the parts that Jesus probably said as a, almost a joke in this chapter, it, it comes at the very beginning in the first parable. And Jesus says this as he, as he closes the first parable. He says, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. I challenge you to go find 99 righteous people that don't need repentance. I challenge you in light of the fact that the Bible says that there's no one righteous, not even one. So as Jesus looks and he looks lost people in the eye, of two frames of thought, both of license and legalism, he says, God loves you so much that he is seeking you, and you can be found by the blood I'm about to shed. In Hampstead Baptist Church, I, I would ask you this. How would you respond to the story of God's prodigal love, of his lavish love, for me and for you. Maybe as we, we sing our, our closing song here, you would pray for your child, your friend, your co-worker, who you know is far, far, far from where they should be. One of the most, most heartbreaking things that I see in my life is I, is I watch so many kids come up through middle school and high school and college, and I, I follow many of them, and I... I remember praying with some kids and them saying, I'm going to be a pastor or a missionary or I'm going to do this and i got these big aspirations. And They don't just fall short of the mark. They, they run from their call. They don't just fall short of the mark in, in some worldly perspective. They run actively from God. And I get to watch it all because we in 2016 and 17 get the privilege I've seen everybody's life laid out on social media. It's heartbreaking. Would you pray for that person that you know that has run and run and run from the Lord God Almighty? Would you also pray 
for the person that you know is running from the Lord our God that sits here in church with you every Sunday. And I would be remiss not to remind you what Jesus said about those that would only point the finger of sin at others. That Jesus said, oh, you brood of vipers, you're twice as fit for help as they are. So please, as we respond and we sing, and you guys, I, I, I assume the altar here is open if you'd like to come pray, or I'll pray with you, and your pastor's there in the back on his vacation day, so um, pray with him all you want to as well. Also, don't forget that you are called yourself to be a light and a beacon for the gospel. And maybe in 2017, our resolution should be not health in a physical way, though that's important. Not wealth in a physical way, though we won't lie to each other and say that's not important. But maybe we would pray for health and wealth in a spiritual way that we would find Jesus and love the Bible and love His law more than we ever have before. So there you have it. The gospel in a nutshell told over and over and over again in one parable. How would you respond to such a thing? Let me, let me pray and then I assume we have another song. Is that right? I should have looked at the bulletin. Let me pray for you all and then you all can stand and sing and respond as the Holy Spirit would lead you to respond. Father God, we love you. And God, please remind us over and over and over again how you love us so much more. God, would our focus right now be not on how much we can do for you because, God, we can do nothing for you. But on how much you have done for us. God, would you allow us to focus in on how much you love us? God, we all pray right now for those that we love dearly that are running from you. God, we pray that you would use us as gospel vessels. That we would have the words of grace on our lips. And maybe those that we love dearly, our, our, our children, our relatives, our co-workers. That maybe they wouldn't have to hit the bottom of the barrel before they look up and see your glory. We pray for them. We pray that through your might and your will that you would open their eyes. God, we ask that you continue to bring us. That we have a clear and a crisp and a concise message that your son Jesus lived the life that we couldn't live. And he died the death he didn't deserve in our place so we could have complete joy. God, may we resolve to make that the center of our lives no matter what we do or where we go. And God, finally, God, would you, would you keep your hand of blessing on this church? Would you keep the pastor focused on it? rightly preaching the word. God, would you allow a hedge of protection and those, those good Christian soldiers around him to keep him joyful, to protect him and his family so that they can lead as you've called them to lead. How would you continue to make this church a light and beacon for this community and beyond? For the name of our Savior, the source of our power, Jesus, and only Jesus. And God, would your Holy Spirit move us? Only the Holy Spirit can move. Amen.